And with that, I will turn it over to Claudia. Great, thanks so much, Rebecca. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad to see you all. Um, my name is Claudia Holland. I'm Chief of the Bureau of Library Development in the Division of Library and Information Services. It's great to see you all. If you have a webcam and want to turn it on, I'd love to see you. I think everybody wants to see you. Um, I have to say, though, I kind of miss the errant cat and dog chatter in the background. No, I don't really, but uh, if you have one, it's okay. Uh, it's great to have you on the call today. I really appreciate your making the time to participate. Um, I think based on the number of registrations and the people on the call, uh, this is a topic is one that uh, re uh, resonates with many people. Uh, it's definitely a topic we need to talk about and share experiences, best practices, uh, and policy ideas with one another. Remember that these conversations are really for you. It's not about me talking at you. It's, I really want to hear what you have to say and certainly your colleagues do. So please don't hesitate to jump in at any time. Um, for those of you who participated in DLIS discussions before, you know that I generally tend to invite uh, others to come and talk because again, I like to have people in the field on these conversations or in these conversations rather than me just talking at you, which is kind of a bummer. Uh, so I'm pleased that several library staff have agreed to share and uh, this is just sort of to help us get started in conversation and also find out a little bit more about what's going on in their neck of the woods too. I'm happy to have Adam Chang with Citrus County Library System. Adam, if you wanna wave your hand, that would be nice. Uh, Pamela Monroe and Mallory Adams from the Leroy Collins Leon County Public Library. And Jonathan Dolce with Astor County Library, which is a branch of the Lake County Library System. Thank you all for being here. So why don't we tell, I was gonna, start with a landmark federal case that I wanted to tell, share a little bit with you about, but I think I'll hold off on that for right now. And let, let's start by talking about what's going on in your libraries. And then if we have time to deal with what I've learned on, uh, about some of the reading I've done, that might be helpful to you. So let's start with you, Adam. Uh, what have you been doing in your library or what is your library doing uh, to uh, address the needs of uh, uh, people experiencing homelessness in your area. Um, you know, was there an increase in this group that is that sort of sparked what happened or you just decided this was a group that, that wasn't necessarily being addressed um, by the library services and you wanted to do that? Okay, uh, sure. Um, I think they're probably there was probably an increase in this, but it, it, as you said, it was an area that we weren't particularly serving um, as well as we'd have, we'd have liked. So um, as part of our adult literacy services, um, our adult literacy service librarian, she started reaching out to some of our um, local shelters and many of them um, as a requirement for them to be there, they, they spend quite a bit of time there. They have to follow certain rules to be able to stay. Um, but we started asking if any of the residents there um, you know, needed any sort of particular help with getting a GED and things like that, getting back into the workforce. And from that, we had probably about half a dozen um, people say that, yes, they were looking for some GED service. So those people now meet one on one with our tutors uh, for free GED kind of assistance to get them sort of back in that process. But they come over maybe two or three times a week in some cases to study and work towards their GED. We just had one gentleman actually complete all parts of his GED. He just graduated and, and finished um, that. Um, so we're excited about that. We've had one that's actually going through Career Island High School. Um, but I think the, the newest thing that we're starting is um, we met with some of the different organizers of the shelters. And we started talking about instead of just offering a GED class, maybe we could offer something to help them transition a little bit easier back into the workforce once they have kind of completed their stay in, in the shelter. 
Um, and that's now turned into we're, we're starting to offer classes, uh, weekly classes for um, residents of the shelter. And it's things like computer basics. We're teaching them how to set up a professional email, how to attach documents like resumes, um, creating a resume, what to expect in a job interview, what to wear, what kind of questions, make sure you show up early, those sorts of things. Uh, and then it concludes, uh, we're, well, we're going to conclude with a mock interview and um, job search tips. So mm -hmm. while some of them are doing mock interviews one-on-one -on -one with some staff, the rest of them will be doing job searches. So are you doing that in the library? All of these services are in the library? Yes. For the GED tutoring, they come over one-on-one -on -one for mm -hmm. that. Um, but when we do the actual classes, the uh, different shelters, they actually bus them over um, in a group of okay. about 12 people. And then our instruction and research librarians will kind of offer a class for them. Mm -hmm. I see. Great. Sounds wonderful. And you had mentioned, too, that y'all are providing uh, food food pantry maybe or uh clothing or something like that but no maybe not maybe i'm no. making you up with another <laughs> library i'm sorry that's okay <laughs> <laughs> well thank you adam uh jonathan are you on oh i can't i can't hear you jonathan okay have you got a, a mic by chance Oh, Elise is standing in for Jonathan. Okay, great, Elise. Um, if you want <clears throat> to share anything, just you can put it in chat if you'd like. Um, meanwhile, while you're doing that, uh, I'm going to ask Brandon. Uh, Brandon asks, uh, are volunteers or library staff tutoring for the doing the tutoring for the GED? Adam, I think that's your question. Oh. Uh, sure. Um, so it's volunteers that are are tutoring for the GED um, through our adult literacy services program. Um, the classes that we offer in our our computer labs, those are instructor led by our staff, but tutoring is done by volunteers. Okay. So are you partnering with any organizations as well? Mm -hmm. um, not at this time, no. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, so, um, Elise, if you want to share what you have, uh, what's going on in, in your library, that would be awesome. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to turn to Pamela and Mallory from Leon County. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hey. don't see Mallory in the chat, but that, that's okay. I can share a little bit about what we've been doing in Leon County. So, um, about a year, a little bit more than a year ago, Leon County um, saw this need. I, I don't know if you all are familiar with our strategic plan, probably not, but it's called the Essential Libraries Initiative. And a big part of that was trying to make sure that we are connecting more to the community and some of the community needs. And um, we have seen a big push in more um, people experiencing homelessness, um, in here in Leon County and especially around our main library, a couple of reasons. We're very close to the Greyhound bus station as well as the bus line um, for the county. Um, but that, of course, doesn't mean anything because sometimes people can't even get there. So they end up, we've got a park across the street. People end up sleeping in our park. They're on our front porch. Um, just, you know, we're, we've really noticed this huge influx. Um, so because of that, we have been granted a lovely new position called our Community Resources Specialist, and that's Mallory. And Mallory is a social worker who works right here in the main oh. library, but she actually works for our entire library system. We have um, six other branches. And um, right now, actually, one of the things that she's doing is she's going into those other branches uh, and two of the branches where we see that highest need of services, but these are also branches where there are little tent cities that are close to them that are like right back there in behind the parking lot. So um, since we've 
had this wonderful person come on and she's actually <laughs> only been with us for probably about two or three months, but she's made such a huge impact with um, connecting the patrons to the services, but not just that, um, because Leon County noticed this growing problem, our HSCP or Human Services and Community Partnerships Department within the county, um, they requested two host deputies and host means, I'm gonna get it wrong, it is our homeless outreach services team. And I think the S is wrong, but what these are, there are two Leon County, yeah, street team, thank you, Casey. <laughs> Casey's on with me, our homeless <laughs> outreach <Thank> street team. <laughs> uh, but these are two Leon County Sheriff's um, officers who are just, they're dressed in um, just a polo and, and, you know, and jeans, but they go around and talk with a lot of the people experiencing homelessness in our area, just trying to make sure that they can also connect them with whatever services are needed. So maybe someone's car is broken down in the library's parking lot. If we have that, we'll call Mallory, we'll get in touch with the, with the family and, um, and try to see what we can do in order to help them with getting their car fixed. And I mean, we actually have done that with a couple of people. We also helped enroll some of their kids in school. So um, we see the need has grown, but because of that, we brought in, and I'm very grateful for the county actually for recognizing this, a professional who's helping to connect the patron with the services because the reality is, you know, a lot of my staff are not trained to do some of these things, sure. as well as having some of the compassion to sit down and talk with um, folks about the stuff that's needed. Um, I was in her office this morning and she connects with so many services around the entire county that are dealing with food. You know, who's giving out food? Um, so she's, she's putting that stuff up on posters and, or bulletin boards and things like that that we may have in the library so that some of our um, patrons who are coming in here every day, you know, to use the computers and to get out of the heat um, so that they know where they can go on Tuesday afternoon to get a meal. Um, she's also putting up, you know, benefits. So she will sit down, she talks with people, helps them get housing, um, you know, getting into some of the shelters, even getting some, you know, social security help, all of these types of things. So that's kind of what we've been doing for the past, it's only really been three months, <laughs> but she hit the ground running. Um, awesome. That's what's going on in Leon County. So I have a question. So the the county, or, or, so did did your did the library system hire her or is her funding from another part of the county? Does that make sense? I don't even know. Yes, it does. <laughs> she what... she actually um, belongs to us. She uh -huh. was hired by the library. Her office is also in here as well. Um, and a part as a part of her job description, she's also going to be probably in the next year or so taking on interns because, you know, we're right here in Tallahassee. We've got Florida a and University that has a social work department as well as FSU. And um, yeah. these are real needs that people have every day. And we want to be able to make sure that we're also connecting to them. But we work so well in this county with each other as far as department wise. Is that, so we get a lot of data and a lot of information, um, a lot of, she works very closely with our human services and community partnerships department as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome, sounds wonderful. It is. Um, just remember who, if you have questions, pipe in, you can ask a question anytime through your microphone or uh, turn on your webcam or through chat. Um, I wanna jump back to Elise for just a minute with, and, and thank you, Pamela, and with, um, uh, she's stepping in for Jonathan. She says, uh, we have a food, now this is at um, uh, Astor County. 
We have a food pantry that's been a great help for our community. We also give out toiletries, cleaning supplies, baby needs, et cetera. Ladies needs are things you can't buy with SNAP. So that's a good thing to remember for sure. Um, she also adds, we have a, we also have a small space. Clearly I confused you and Adam. <laughs> we also have a small pay, space with donated clothing items for all ages. We try to keep shirts and slacks for interviews. We also have mostly, or excuse me, monthly dinners that are open to all the community, but gives our people a good hot meal and fellowship. That's, that's wonderful. Wow. Um, here's a question for you, Pamela, from Heather. Has your community resource specialist found a best way to communicate these great opportunities to the other locations? Is there an internal database or does she send flyers out to each location for display? Well, um, thank you for the question. She sends flyers out, but she also goes out um, to the different locations as well. I think that she's working on, I mean, maybe it's Tuesdays and Thursdays and she's putting them on a rotation. Currently she's got two um, branches that she's focusing on, but that's gonna expand as she sees the need. Mm -hmm. She also works very, very closely with our host deputies. Um, I mean, she's got their phone numbers and, and they uh -huh. came in and talked to our entire library staff which was really nice. And, and the host deputies have gone into the other branches as well so that they can be, you know, hey, if you see a person who is experiencing homelessness but doesn't, um, you know, they don't have to be causing a problem or anything. These yeah. guys, they just want to go in and say, hey, what can I do for you? How can we help you? And uh, they've been a very, very positive force that, of law enforcement that's not going in and being punitive or things like that. Mm -hmm. They approach people with, how can we help? Yeah. And um, and that's made a big, it's a, made a huge impact, I feel like, on our community, as well as kind of helping us with some of the things that we have going on in here. Um, Leon County used to have a deputy that was in the main library downtown. We don't have that anymore. So it's really important that we are, you know, making the connections with the people that we do have coming into the building so that we can even keep, you know, our staff and other patrons safe as well. Um, trying to read, Heather also sent a, an email. Okay, best way to communicate these opportunities. Oh, okay, that must've been the same, same thing. Okay, I'm sorry, I just saw it. That's okay. Um, I, I also wanted to add that on Mallory's door, she's got her contact information. So we have people that will actually come to the library looking for her, Wow, which is another great thing. So we have people out there within our HSCP community that are saying, hey, you need to fill out a job application. You know, you can go to the library and um you know someone there will help you out or oh you're having problems with getting SNAP. there's someone in the library that can help you um you know do that paperwork so she's she's awesome <laughs> i feel like eventually we might need two of her of course but um just to know that our other county divisions and departments are referring people to us just kind of lets you know that as a county, we're all working together because we all see this problem. And um, I was at a meeting, oh, probably about a month ago, and we actually get together with other departments, you know, facilities and parks and rec, parks and recs seeing the same thing. They've got, you know, their parks and then they've got someone living in a tent in the park that closes at sundown. Um, but, you know, we're all sitting down and having the conversation about how do we help these people, you know, have a different life, move into something better yeah. or just something different? Mm -hmm. And treating them with respect yeah. and dignity, the same Absolutely. way you would anyone else, for sure. Absolutely. Um, Casey also adds that uh, Mallory stays connected to all staff through Teams chat. And she'll update any system-wide or ongoing observations or resources through that mechanism. Thanks, Casey. Um, um, can I add one more thing, Claudia? Absolutely. Um, 
Mallory is currently also working with some of the other organizations that we have um, to bring them out and do things at our branches. For example, we've got the, a mobile health unit. One of our local churches runs a mobile health unit. So Mallory is having them come out to all of our branches. So she's scheduling that so that, you know, we people can come to any branch and get some of the services that are needed. Um, she's organizing things like, you know, legal aid. They may come in. So we've got programs like that that we might not, you know, we may want them. And a lot of times we're thinking, oh, our people can lead these programs. No, she's bringing the programs to us. And all we have to do is advertise it and count how many people come, right? <laughs> It's, it's bringing more people into our library, but it's also touching the pulse of the community, which is, you know, why we're here in the first place, right? So it's really exciting. It is. All right. That's wonderful. I'm, I'm putting the question out there to all of you who are on, on with us today. What, what are your libraries doing? Uh, what have you tried and that may not, that didn't necessarily work? Um, and how did you tweak it to make it work? Um, what would you like to do? I know there are a lot of folks out there. Yes, Jennifer. Hey, hey. hi, everybody. Hey. Thank you so much, Pamela and Adam and Jonathan Standen, whose name I can't remember. I'm sorry. Um, so we're uh, Mendel Public Library. I see one of my coworkers, Alyssa, on the call, too. Um, we're a municipal library in Palm Beach County, and we've partnered with our food bank. So we have a benefits outreach specialist that comes um, a couple times a week. And his job is that he can um, both do the application for food stamps and qualify the person all in the same conversation, right? I had no idea that it took 10 plus days once you filled out your application for someone and then to call you to qualify you, right? Mm -hmm. Food stamps. So that's been an amazing thing for us. Uh, and that's through our Palm Beach County Food Bank. Um, we have other services like Legal Aid comes in. Um, we have a community ID group. Um, that will come in and take uh, photo IDs for people. Um, we, in our youth services department, have a grant-funded social worker who is based on the grant perimeters. She works with families who have children 22 or younger. Um, and she does a lot like what Pamela, um, what your social worker does, kind of like connecting people, um, help tracking them, making sure they get services. Um, we've had her for about three months, so similar to you, Pamela. Um, and, uh, you know, we work closely with DCF and all of our community partners to kind of help people. Um, in addition to our benefits outreach specialists who can qualify people for their food stamps, we also have... Um, what's called Lois's Food for Kids. And so that's a Palm Beach County thing that a funder has and their weekend meal bags for uh, children. Um, so each child in the household can have a bag and it's one family meal, two kid meal um, dinners and um, two lunches and breakfast for a child. Um, we find the bags are a little heavy because there's canned things, you know? Um, so it's heavy for like a five-year-old to kind of heave a bag of five, cans and a pound of rice or beans or whatever. Um, but that's been really helpful. We also um, have sanitary um, things for our families and toiletries, but those things are kind of um, just donated and, and when people give it to us, right? And sometimes they'll give us like the little toiletry stuff or like, it's really one, I would never say no to a donation that's a toiletry, but it's really wonderful when the recipient of the toiletry actually looks in it and it's like Gillette shaving cream, you know, or ivory soap, like something they would see on the shelf and not like a miniature that's like half used. So, um, but we accept almost anything, like I'm sure the rest of you, I don't know if Alyssa is connected to a microphone or if she wants to speak, put you on the spot, Alyssa. She does a lot too, connecting with community organizations to come in and, and do programs for us, much like Pamela. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jennifer. Uh, Tori Hirsch uh, from Lee County, she says Lee County has a hot 
team organized by Human and Veteran Services. We partner with them and as of this morning began conversations with the local legal aid office to assist patrons of all levels. That's wonderful as well. Um, I think partnerships are absolutely critical uh, for whatever you're going to plan to do. Obviously, you know, it's to your benefit and theirs uh, to, to partner with the library um, and to serve this, this uh, constituency. I have a comment here from uh, Gretchen. It says, hi, Claudia, could you ask if anyone has an adult literacy program offered at their library and who it is that does the literacy tutoring? Okay, there you go. Who's doing literacy at their libraries? Pamela is doing it? Yes, we are. Um, we have an adult literacy program at our library that we have a person who that's, she does adult literacy. She also connects um, with tutors. We have adult literacy tutors as well. Um, and it's a, it's a, this program has been going on for a while. She mm -hmm. works um, with just, just about anyone. She's also doing a lot with, um, with the career online high school. We just currently, ratified an MOU with Florida a and University's TRIO program. So we're going to be, you know, reaching down and trying to also help um, people get their career online high school diploma, then hopefully sending them over to the university. Um, so yes, we well, have- Pamela, one. what is TRIO? I'm sorry. TRIO, oh, see, I knew you were going to ask me that. And sorry. I <laughs> did not do, it's an acronym for, for what, Casey? Trio. Come on, help me okay. out. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have asked that. That's okay. It's Casey. Do you know what TRIO stands for? <laughs> I can look it up real quick. It is actually not an acronym, and I remember that. Oh, that's our, right, because it said not an acronym. Typically says like the Florida A and M TRIO parentheses, not an acronym. Not an acronym. Those parentheses. <laughs> oh. But it's it's one of their educational um, centers that helps, you know, students who maybe didn't have a traditional educational path I'd get say. connected within the university. But it's not an not, an, not acronym. an acronym. Sorry. Sorry <laughs> there were a lot of acronyms being Thanks, thrown Casey. around when we were writing this agenda item. I'll say that. So thank you. That's why I asked Casey to jump in because this was her agenda item. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, so we we have that we're connecting. We um, when we have um, and Karen Strange is really passionate about her our adult literacy program. I mean, she's been doing it for a while, and so much of it is volunteering. She has volunteers that come in and sign up, and will even help a person. Currently, she's trying to get a couple of people all the way through the career online high school program using our volunteers. So um, I could connect whoever asked the question with Karen Strange. And actually, if they had questions um, and you know wanted to know more about our adult literacy program, but she's, she's awesome. Um, but we've also, because of our Central Libraries Initiative, and I could let Casey speak on this because this is one of her babies, because of our Central Libraries Initiative, we've taken our library staff and helped them um, have a focus area. In case you want to jump in, no? Okay, good. Sorry, it's okay. Delay, you delay. Um, part of our Central Libraries Initiative, or ELI, um, is that we have divided all of what we do into four focus areas. So we have literacy and lifelong learning. We have arts and humanities, civic and community engagement, and business and workforce development. Um, so we tailor our annual plan um, to this and to kind of make things a little more streamlined and to help our staff sort of develop into, you know, experts, at least on a piece. We are, we've divided them up into focus area groups. So, um, and that's cross location. So all of our locations are involved in these groups. It's not just like our main staff. It's not just youth or adult. 
Um, so it's really giving them an opportunity to come together and work in groups of people who they wouldn't normally be able to work with because of geographical locations, or maybe they focus on different um, on a different target audience. Um, so I we're really excited about that. It's still very new, so we're um, we're starting to get that off the ground. But that way, you know, staff don't have to be an expert in all the things. Um, they can really hone in on one of these areas. Um, to become the expert in um, while still working with the other folks focus groups. Um, yeah, that sounds wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I just want to mention a couple of things in, that are in chat. Clarissa from Miami Dade, I believe, uh, has shared some uh, links to the programs that they're providing for adult learning and not sure what the other one is, but she'll tell us maybe, I hope. Um, Kelsey from uh, uh, Martin County it says, we are also providing uh, adult literacy. Our coordinator connects with students and volunteers. We offer both one-on-one -on -one sessions and group classes. And Barbara from Alachua, she says they have a, uh, an adult literacy program. Uh, let's see. Uh, Katrina, Katrina, you want to, you could speak for a moment about uh, uh, the literacy discussions that you're going to host. I'm waiting for my camera to come on and for me to be, yeah, it's on a side monitor. There we go. I'm looking in the right direction. Hey, um, so we've uh, started a series of discussions and um, some folks here have already already been to the first one, but we'll be hosting a regularly, uh, probably quarterly, depending on what people want to do, um, series of discussions around different topics having to do with adult literacy and uh, English language instruction. And um, I put my email there in the chat. So just send me a quick um, email if you'd like to be on that list to be notified of those, those programs. Right. Thank you, Katrina. And Casey added to our adult literacy ninja. I kind of like that. Um, also does a lot of work with our local international rescue committee, which works with refugees. Uh, those of you who are perhaps uh, from South or Central Florida or even other areas, I'm sure you are working closely with uh, refugee or um, you know, new uh, American populations. Um, if you have something you want to share about what y'all are doing, that would be great. Um, anyway, so anybody have something they want to add? If you don't, I'm going to start asking you questions now. <laughs> so I, I, I want to sort of talk about the nitty gritty of um, individuals who come in the library who um, uh, are we think uh, experiencing homelessness and how do you how do you manage these um, people in terms of um, you know behaviors that you that are not typical for a library uh, patron how do you handle that how does your library di differentiate between nuisance behavior and problem behavior uh, have you had this experience? I'm sure you have um, to some degree. I can remember when I worked for the Fairfax County Public Library System, um, my experience was with individuals who were both, you know, e extremely quiet, extremely reticent. They would come in, they would, you know, they may look at materials, they may not. Um, and then others who would come in who were uh, belligerent because they were drinking or perhaps on drugs. Um, and so what kind of policies do you have to handle these kinds of situations? I'm assuming you have policies. Everybody has a policy of some sort. <laughs> Uh, this is Jennifer at Mandel, you know, like everybody, I mean, we have policies where you can't be belligerent and things like that. 
And what we're starting to do with um, our social worker is have more robust conversations around uh, trauma-informed services and what that looks like for our library staff and entering those conversations, right? Um, and entering them with empathy and kindness and grace, um, but, you know, giving, ultimately giving people a choice, like, you know, just like we would our children or adults or anybody, you know, I'm sorry, this is our rule. You can't be belligerent or drinking alcohol. It's your choice. You know, either you can stay and throw that out. I mean, if they're drunk, though, they can't stay. So, you know, I wouldn't say that, but like, this is your choice. These are our rules and it's your decision, right? Making sure that they feel empowered by that, um, you know, and making sure that staff feel comfortable, right, um, in that conversation. So we do a lot of role playing in our youth services department. Mm -hmm. Um, here at the Seminole Library in Pinellas County, uh, we don't have any specific policies for that. We just follow our regular code of conduct, which of course doesn't allow drinking. So we, and I've made it very clear to staff that everybody needs to be held to that same code of conduct, regardless mm -hmm. of their socioeconomic status. Um, and as Jennifer mentioned, one of the things I did is because I noticed our a huge uptick in homelessness in our libraries. And I'm sorry, I, I was a little bit late to this. So if you guys already talked about this, I apologize for repeating it, but uh, oh, go right uh, ahead. But I was really concerned about staff who had made some derogatory comments when we started seeing more homeless people came in, come in. So we purchased the Ryan Dowd homelessness for librarians training for a year. And I've required all staff to take the core four hour training. And then um, there's a lot of other really good trainings as well. So um, that has been very helpful. And I've had staff come to me. And of course, his main focus is empathy, as I'm sure you most of you know. Um, and I've had staff come to me and tell me that was like the best training they've ever had. And they just loved him as a presenter. So um, so that's been very helpful. And uh, one of the things we've also done is we've gotten to know our regulars. We know them by name. So we have regular conversations with them and say good morning to them. So that way, if we do have to address something, they're pretty, um, they, they know they ha have it good by having access to the library all day. So, yeah. <laughs> so they're pretty willing to, to comply with anything we bring up to them. That's great. I like the idea that you're developing relationships with them to the degree that that I think um, makes them feel um, validated, I guess you would say, you know, seen, uh, and also holds them accountable in a very soft way, I think. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that's the case, but it sounds like a good plan to me. Yes. Um, here from, uh, let's see, Kelsey, she says, uh, we have a branch located in a Spanish-speaking area populated with low-income folks and immigrants. Their services are very tailored to their patrons. Uh, the branch has organizations who come in, uh, teen pantries, um, you know, uh, and then she also mentions Ryan Dowd, helped our, their staff in, in, immensely. Um, so thank you for that, Kelsey, and it, feel free to, to join in if you can uh, uh, through your uh, mic. Brandon mentions, uh, we have a patron code of conduct that we enforce with all of our patrons. Greater care and more empathy is used with individuals who are experiencing homelessness and the Ryan Dowd's training is required for all staff as well. Lisa says, Ryan's amazing. The emails he sends have great information. And Vicki, who has chosen to use uh, the, um, the chat, <laughs> says our MLC plan has provided the Ryan Dowd Academy of Training for the last couple of years. It's wonderful and I hear from library directors that they have better staff conversations and empathy because of it. That's great. It's good to know that there is something out there that is sort of, um, you know, on an even playing field for everybody, I guess you would say. Uh, so thank you for the information about Ryan Dowd. <clears throat> Claudia, oh, yes. Um, this is Pamela. We are actually in the process of looking at our code of conduct again because I want to empower my staff more. Absolutely. And um, because we also had a shift in moving from having a deputy in our building to 
having a security officer, which is totally different. Um, and so, what, what? How is um, that well, so when we had a deputy in the building, um, you know, let's just face it, when you have a uniformed police yeah. officer in your building, people are going to act very differently than when you have a security officer and you have to call and it takes 10 minutes for someone to get here. <laughs> um, but because we did have a deputy in the building, there were things in our code of conduct that we didn't have to enforce in a sense because I mean, enforced so much because we had a deputy that was right here. You call him and he'd be there in a second. Um, so even with my staff, I feel like we're having to, you know, step back and look at some situations differently and um, be a little bit more empathetic and sympathetic to some of the things that people are going through. However, um, just like Jonathan said, they follow the code of conduct. And I wanted to make sure that my staff were empowered to call, you know, the police if they needed to, but also, um, you know, know that if you have someone who might be experiencing an episode or something for the moment, they're not totally kicked out and never can come back to the library again. So we've had to look at um, quite a few situations and craft a code of conduct that protects my staff and other patrons, but also has just that little bit of empathy in there where it's not saying just because you did you blew up at, you know, main library, you can't go to any other libraries for the rest of the year, right? You're trespassed mm -hmm. from them all. So we've had, we've been having those conversations and um, we found that, you know, I think Gabrielle put in, that they enforced the standard rule using a three strike policy. We were, you know, looking at some of that too. <laughs> Sometimes that didn't work out very well <laughs> for some of our issues as well. So we just had to review and I would tell anybody, review your code of conduct to make sure that it makes sense to the times that we're living in right now. Because if they haven't been changed since 1991, then uh, you might need to go back and look at it again. <laughs> Good point. Absolutely. Um, Jennifer, when we get it ratified next month, I'll be more than happy to share it with you. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I agree totally that having a policy, if you don't have one, um, it, it does several things, I think. It uh, provides your frontline staff, who really are the ones who are going to be dealing with issues first. Um, it empowers them to know what to do. They have something they can rely on, they can show to the patron, et cetera. And that may help diffuse the situation. Plus, it gives them an idea of how to handle a, a situation that they've never perhaps confronted before, especially with new staff. Um, that was just generally how I feel about it. Uh, plus, it protects the library mm -hmm. uh, legally, I would say, uh, from being accused of, of um, sort of picking on people. Um, and uh, one of the things I did want to share just briefly was uh, a, a case that was um, held in, in 1992, uh, there was a case, uh, Crimer versus Morristown, New Jersey, uh, where there were some legal rulings that emerged. This was a landmark federal case related to intellectual freedom, public libraries, and the First Amendment. And really, to make a long story short, uh, the gentleman who brought the suit uh, was uh, uh, experiencing homelessness. Um, he was essentially kicked out of the library five times for offenses such as, you know, being annoying, nuisance behavior. It's sort of semi-intimidating um, patrons and bad body odor, okay? So two, two important legal rulings came out of this legislation, oh, excuse me, litigation. Uh, one was that there's a constitutional, and this is not going to be anything new to people, I don't think, because if we're all ALA uh, members, we are familiar with what ALA uh, promotes. 
uh, in terms of dealing with marginalized populations. But there is a constitutionally protected right to receive information under the First Amendment. Freedom of expression includes both freedom of speech and the right to free access to information. So that was one ruling that came out of this case. The other is, it is permissible for libraries to expel patrons who violate behavior policies as long as the policies are meeting First Amendment standards. They're reasonable, they're not vague, and they're not overbroad in their application. So creating these uh, policies that you have to be, I think, very careful in the language that you use. If you have access to uh, counsel, uh, it's important to get them to weigh in because that, again, provides you your library with more um, support and um, authority, I, th I would think as well as uh, protection. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you, uh, you know, and see what you thought, you know, what, what, what do you think about when you create a policy, it is kind of like, oh God, policy, and it's gonna take so much time and it's gonna take the attorneys forever to get back with us. And yeah. anyway, so what, what is your thinking about the policy that you have, or maybe you don't have, and how you um, how you would use that, you know, would you would you use that to punish people who are coming into your library, or would you use it to govern behavior for all? I think I saw Pamela raise her hand. Yeah, I, I wanted to weigh in. I said something earlier. We work very, very closely with our county attorney's office on anything policy related. Mm -hmm. And um, it is such a valuable relationship. If you don't have it, get in, get that relationship with someone in your county attorney's office. I mean, we are actually on a first name basis. Her name is Michonne. She's amazing. Um, and even though, you know, she doesn't just work with the library, she works with many other departments. But she told us this, she said, I need to make sure that if I ever have to go to court on behalf of the library, this makes sense to me. Yeah. And um, that was a game changer for us, I think, in the library, because we, we use library jargon. And sometimes we say things that, um, you know, they make sense to us. But we have people that are, you know, in our courthouse that are sitting there saying, OK, I don't understand any of this. <laughs> so it's really it's really important to work with them on, um, you know, making these changes in our code of conduct. Like I said, we're making the changes, but we've actually been working with her on this for a while. She gave me a call earlier today and said, hey, this looks good. Awesome. Uh oh, she froze. So work with your county attorney's office because that way, if they ever need to go to court, they can protect you. <laughs> Agreed. Anyone have any con uh, comments about that? Um, I want to go back to something Elise said in lieu of Jonathan. Uh, we follow the standard code of conduct as well. If someone comes in under the influence, we try to we take care to try to be patient and observe them in case they need medical attention. Most are very well behaved, even when flying high. <laughs> they tend to police themselves, telling each other they need to behave and be respectful. Uh, I've been able to get a few of our patrons into rehab or get help through just patient conversation. That's very kind of you. Um, let's see, uh, Gabrielle says, we also enforce standard rules of conduct using a three strike policy. Most of our branch locations have police officers stationed throughout the day. So are they like rent-a-cops then or are they county cops or what? what are they? Can you tell us, Gabrielle? Uh, and uh, Jennifer, so, yeah, you saw that. Uh, 
Casey also mentions there's value in having fresh eyes look at it too. Absolutely, whoever's developing the policy, get get someone. I would say get someone who's not in the li library profession to look at it. It should be plain language. I agree. Um, Clarissa says from Miami Dade says we have we also have a social worker at at Miami Dade. We recently hired a second second social worker. This is the link to that page. She there, she's providing a link. We also offer hygiene kits at many of our library or branches, and we use the Bright and Dow training for all staff. Our social services and libraries committee meets once a month and offers a space to share other ideas branches are implementing, such as food pantries in certain branches. Uh, being such a large system, we have been working together on bettering our communication so that we can all be on the same page to help all patrons. Excellent. Uh, Casey says, uh, we're also very upfront with, with staff. When our social worker started, that her role was not clinical and she would not be stepping in to handle behavioral issues. Good point, Casey. Uh, setting boundaries for what staff are and not are not uh, going to do to help. That's a good point for sure. Anyone else have anything they would like to add to that particular part of the conversation? I wanna encourage you I'm, I'm jumping in over whoever wanted to talk, so sorry. Uh, um, if you are not familiar with right service at the right time, if you, uh, that is a, uh, uh, a service for a database provided by Orange County Library System, that if you have um, links to services that you can share with them, they will drop them in. Uh, to um, your county so that that information is available not only to libraries but to others who may use that database um, because it is freely accessible. I think in addition to having a good relationship with council, your county council or local council, municipal council, whoever it may be, uh, do you have a good relationship with your local police? Do you have a relationship at all with them? At, at Mendel's, um, we do. We uh, Our library is in this, shares the same city block as our city hall. And there's a police officer stationed at the door of our city hall. And the one that they've given us now is wonderful. Um, is on a first name basis with a lot of our homeless adults and families. Um, and his name is Officer Jones, and I just love him. And so I have his cell phone and my phone. Our social worker does too. Um, and he's just really gracious and humble when he approaches people that are um, experiencing um, homelessness. So we're just, we have not always had Officer Jones. And so we know the flip side, you know? Um, so we're just really great, really, really gracious, you know, for him. Wonderful. You are very lucky, yes. Uh, Tori says at the Fort Myers branch, we have F Fort Myers Police Department officers on site almost daily. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> I mean, is that something planned or not planned, I guess? It's a good thing, she said. Okay, good. We have a wonderful, wonderful relationship with them. Cookies too. Aha, uh -huh, you're you're bribing them with food. I have, I I don't blame you. I would do that too. Here are some suggestions for. And I know we're getting out up on our toward the end of the hour, but for intervention, in case it's helpful. Uh, Calmly adv advise patron of the specific be uh, behavior that's in violation of your policy. So obviously you have to have a policy. If the behavior continues, ask the patron to leave. If the patron doesn't leave, advise the patron they're trespassing. If still don't leave, 
then call the police. The librarian then informs the police that the library wants to institute criminal charges if the patron is still there. If the patron has left, ask the police to file an official offense report. And then the librarian, whoever is in charge at that time, writes a very thorough follow-up report. That may seem harsh to people. And of course, you're gonna make that decision based on whatever your uh, situation is at your library. But I think consistency is um, probably going to work to your favor in the long run. Uh, we could debate that all day probably, but um, certainly up to you and, and whatever you feel is best. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being on the call today. I really, uh, I, I really enjoy hearing what you have to say. And I, I want to thank uh, Adam, Pamela, and Elise, and uh, everyone who has been on the call today for joining in. Uh, as Rebecca mentioned, the recording will be available on, on our WLB uh, YouTube channel. And we'll be sending those that um, those who register the, the link uh, to the recording, as well as a brief survey, of course, it's a library thing, about this session that we hope you'll take just a few minutes to complete. Uh, feel free to share the link to the recording with others who may be in, interested in this topic. I don't have a topic set yet for uh, the um, October discussion. If you have something that you uh, are just dying to talk about or want to hear from others about, please share that topic with me. Um, once that decision is made, we'll certainly keep you posted uh, via the BLD Building Success newsletter on our website and in social media. Uh, that date is October the 17th from 3 to 4 Eastern time. Uh, until then, I hope I see you again. Please be safe, stay healthy, and let us know how we can assist you in your work. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care.